Um, so in the sense of motivation, what motivates our discussion of symmetries is really what we observe, the kind of things you can do when you um, pay attention to symmetries. So this is was our last uh, problem set. And actually this problem set is itself an illustration of power of symmetry arguments. And um, in the background is, the, is this, uh, um, thing which is proved as uh, uh, I can't pronounce this uh, German names well. Noether's theorem. Um, it's spelled uh, Noether's theorem after I think Emma Noether. That's her name. Full name. Is it Emma Noether? Uh, I I'm not good with the first names. Uh, Amy Noether. <laughs> So, um, so she proved a theorem. She's a, a mathematician from like 100 years ago. Uh, she proved a theorem that says whenever there's a, a differentiable symmetry, meaning continuous symmetry, like a translational and uh, a rotational symmetry, then those diff continuous symmetries lead to a conserved quantity. It's this is an important theorem in classical mechanics and. Um, and it connects, um, it, it uh, gives you the mathematical connection between the conserved quantities that people have noticed for a very long time, well before uh, the 100 years ago when an author proved this theorem, and um, mathematical structure of the, the physical laws that we see. And so to, be strict, the kind of conserved quantity we are going to look at um, are not necessarily um, uh, directly connected to Noether's theorem in that they are not differentiable symmetry, they are not continuous, they are discrete symmetries, <laughs> but uh, there is a still connection between um, these uh, discrete symmetries and some aspect of uh, things that we observe that is conserved. Uh, if nothing else, we can just invent a number <laughs> and that relates to that symmetry and we say that conserved under the symmetry operation. And when you remember, think back to this problem set, there were certain questions that we were asking, you know, uh, what decays do we know that we cannot, we know before considering anything else, we know that it cannot happen because it violates conservation of lepton number. And, um, and there's a symmetry that's associated with this conservation of lepton number. And I think it's called like U2 symmetry. It's, this is where it gets a little bit into weeds of particle physics theory that's out of my depth. <laughs> so uh, I'll talk too much other than to say that this conservation of lepton number, it has an associated symmetry. And the reason we can say that um, uh, without knowing much about interaction between up and down quark in a pion, we can say that this interaction never happens because uh, we know whatever complicated interaction there is, it has to obey this symmetry. And we can see that this particular interaction doesn't obey the symmetry. And uh, there are other questions uh, uh, that's related in a similar way, such as strangeness, uh, which is a symmetry that's observed by uh, two of the interactions we've talked about, electromagnetic and strong force, but not the weak interaction as we'll discuss in a bit. Um, not, well, we'll discuss a weak interaction, not necessarily in connection with the strangeness. Um, and this was the question where we kind of went through, I think there's a total of seven. Uh, you had it as one of your conceptual questions. Um, depending on how you count, we introduced like total of seven or something. And uh, this one lists the five. Uh, once that you have dealt at least to it, or I guess um, conservation of momentum and energy, uh, because whenever you have a collider configuration, you can always assume that you, can always put in enough energy and momentum to make things happen. But all these other quantities, there are conserved quantities and um, the, the fact that these quantities are conserved can be traced back to some kind of symmetry. And, and this is what uh, motivates our study of symmetry. In fact, you could, uh, um, if you <laughs> want you to boil down all of particle physics into a single sentence, it would be, it's a study of fundamental symmetry. Uh, or you know, fundamental symmetry obeyed by elementary particles. 
Um, so that's our uh, motivation. And that's uh, why we start uh, paying close attention to symmetries and uh, look at uh, what we can learn from that. So, uh, so I guess these are severely misnumbered because this should be numbers nine and 10. Whatever, um, <laughs> this is my <laughs> old lecture slides. It's the only version I could find. Uh, let's, can I open it? Okay, yeah. So this is a, a it's a kind of a weird file format. It's a scalable vector graphics, but it's a, <laughs> um, it's got a, a special text in it that allows me to use it like a presentation slides. So <laughs> if you are downloading that file and looking at it yourself, open it in a web browser. It'll open in Chrome, it'll open in Edge, it'll open in Firefox, and in all of them, it'll kind of, um, it'll work like a slide. So if you click, it'll flip, uh, you can use arrows to navigate. <laughs> so, so, um, so, so let me um, kind of go through this, um, um, overview of some of the symmetries and the, the considerations that come in. Um, and I'm kind of, um, sorry, I'm not a good storyteller. I think this is, this would be considered a huge spoiler in a storytelling. It's like, I don't know, a thing as a subtitle to Fellowship of the Ring, Death of Gandalf or something like that. <laughs> She comes back. Oh, wait, I guess I should. You know, that story is super old. You should already know what it is about. Um, it, both the movie and novel are super old. So anyways, so, so in this <laughs> slide, we'll, have, we'll talk about these discrete symmetries, which go by the, their uh, letter representation, representation CPT. C stands for charge conjugation. You know, I never figured out if C is for charge or C is for conjugation, but it stands for charge conjugation. I'll describe that in more detail in a bit. P stands for parity uh, or parity, uh, reversal parity, inverse, uh, inversal parity. <laughs> we'll describe that in a bit as well. And T stands for time reversal. Um, these are all operations that you can imagine doing to either a physical parameter like a charge or coordinate variable like a parity that applies to the three spatial coordinate variables or time reversal that refer uh, that relates to the time coordinate. So, so we'll talk about the discrete symmetries a little bit and I'll tell you the story about story that's titled in a very spoilerific way as a fall of parity. And we'll talk about how that's important to um, or how the structure that is informed by that is reflected in the standard model. This is all uh, uh, this is all physics from half a century ago. That's all already been worked into the standard model. So, um, so the CPT uh, symmetries. First is the charge conjugation, and the operation is uh, what you might have guessed if you think of conjugation like. Um, um, uh, the, the complex conjugate. So if you're thinking of complex conjugate uh, or complex conjugate, then uh, the operation you do there is you take the imaginary I and wherever you, wherever you see it, you make it into minus I. So charge conjugation is kind of like that. Wherever you see charge Q, you turn it into minus Q. And in asking the question, is charge conjugation a symmetry of nature? What we are asking is, do the laws of physics change when you do this operation? And, um, and thinking naively, it's easy to think that, uh, of course, laws of physics change if you turn your positive charges into negative charges. Because um, if, if uh, you might be naively uh, thinking about something like this, if you have a positive charge, then you can draw electric fields coming from the positive charge. And it looks like what I'm drawing that right now, kind of. And you say, uh, let's imagine doing a charge conjugation operation here. Then we under the charge conjugation operation, uh, this becomes a negative charge. And when you look at the electric fields around the negative charge, 
it looks nothing like electric fields are on the positive charge. For one, electric fields are pointing towards the negative charge. So, so it's easy to think uh, from that uh, first level consideration that uh, something has changed when you uh, change the positive charge into negative charge. Uh, but I want you to think about it more carefully. It really comes down to if anything has changed, how would we know? As in, if the direction of electric fields really have changed like this, by what measurement method, by what mechanism would we figure out that electric fields actually change the direction? You might say, oh, that's a silly question to ask. You do it by placing a, post, a test charge. You place a test charge. When the test charges are uh, pushed away, then, then you have positive charge. When test charges are pulled, uh, pulled in, you have negative charge. And this is where you have to remember, test charges themselves have a charge. So when you, do, when you apply this asymmetry operation to your system, you have to be careful to apply it to the entire system. Um, of course, if you <laughs> apply it to only a small portion of uh, your system, then even if it's a symmetry that's uh, obeyed by the nature, if you are just changing your system willy nilly, then yeah, that has nothing to do with whatever is conserved or not. So, so in order to properly investigate if a particular symmetry is obeyed by nature, you have to be uh, sure to uh, apply that operation to enough of the system so that you can clearly see that uh, it is an observed symmetry or it is not an observed symmetry. And so this is why the first law, this um, slide list is Coulomb's law that describes the force on the electric charges. So once you get to the point of measuring forces themselves, that's where uh, we don't have to worry as much about um, kind of us arbitrarily, uh, um, or we have less of a reliance on arbitrary conventions, you know, that the electric fields come out of positive charge. That's a arbitrary convention. We could have actually chosen to draw in it the other way and it actually would have worked fine as long as we stuck to some reasonable consistent convention. Um, so, so on this slide, all the laws that I'm listing are quite explicitly um, force laws so that uh, we are considering forces, things that we can measure directly. We don't have to rely on conventions that, so we don't have to rely on arbitrary conventions. And as you look at each of these laws, I hope you see that um, they are indeed invariant. They do not change when you apply this charge conjugation operation. Coulomb's law is the easiest one to see because when you do charge conjugation operation, really all you are doing is you are um, doing this kind of a symbolic operation. Um, you are taking, so all the constants remain the same. Those things don't change. What has changed is the Q1 and Q2, the two charges, they become minus Q1 and minus Q2. And uh, the signs, they will cancel out. Um, so under charge conjugation, you will still have the law that we described in words before that like charges repel, opposite charges attract. Oh wait, I guess that would have been in physics 4B, not in this class. <laughs> so, so Coulomb's law is easy to see that. It takes a little bit of a more work to see it in um, this representation of electromagnetic force or what's sometimes called the Lorentz force. Because if you naively simply take a Q, and turn it into minus Q, then you might think, hey, my force has reversed the direction. So then isn't this showing that charge conjugation is not a symmetry? You have to be careful because um, if I did that, I would be making the same mistake that I made just a couple of minutes ago, except the other way around. I'm changing the charge of the test charge, but I'm not seeing what kind of changes occur to the electric field. So you have to think about what's producing the electric field. Electric field is being, being produced by some kind of charge distribution. And when you're doing charge conjugation, you are going to end up changing the direction of electric field as well. And looking at the second term here, velocity won't change um, because velocity has nothing to do with the um, uh, sign of charge, but the magnetic field, which comes from current, 
Um, so if you imagine having some electric current and you keep everything in the setup the same, except that you reverse the charge, then the direction of current will change. So when the direction of current changes, magnetic field will also reverse the direction. So, so when you carefully go through each of the quantities, how this uh, uh, symmetry operation affects each of the quantities, then you see, oh, these minus signs will cancel each other out. And we see that electromagnetic force is, it's a symmet um, it obeys the charge conjugation symmetry. And last example is something I put in to highlight um, this thing that uh, it's something that I missed when I was a student. So, so someone could ask this question, does gravity uh, obey a charge conjugation uh, symmetry? And you might look at the person and think gravity has nothing to do with electric charge. So why should it? And the um, answer would be, yeah, that's what you would expect. And to the extent that is true, to the extent that you truly do not see an actual change in the gravitational force between positive charges and negative charges, then yes, gravity obeys charge conjugation symmetry. Because when you do this operation, nothing here changes. Um, so there are people who uh, do tests of uh, fundamental symmetry experiments. And one of the things actually people do is that kind of measurement, kind of testing the gravitational interaction between particles and antiparticles. That turns out to be, works out to be a test of things like a charge conjugation symmetry for gravitational force. So that's uh, one of the three symmetries. I'll go more quickly with the other two. Um, the second one that <laughs> I'm going a little out of order, but the second one that I think it's uh, relatively easy to describe is the time reversal symmetry. Um, here the operation is um, in the expressions, wherever you see the reference to time, then you do change it to minus t. Now, you might be thinking uh, there aren't that many laws of physics where um, you see reference to time explicitly. I mean, you have a, like a, a wave solution, but those are solutions, wave solutions are not themselves laws of physics. So what I want you to keep in mind uh, for something like time reversal symmetry are um, the places where the time dependence is hidden. So uh, I have an example expression here, velocity. Velocity can be represented as change of position or rate of change of position. So when you do this time reversal operation, then the numerate, numerator of this derivative doesn't change, but this dt on the denominator, it changes into minus dt. So whenever you have uh, things that are represented as first order derivative of time, then under time reversal operation, those the signs of those the first order, the, the first order time derivative will change. And in the example of Biot-Savart's law, I have a lot of examples of, from physics for me, so I hope it's, uh, well, you know, you all remember this. <laughs> when you look at Biot-Savart's law, it has this term that depends on the current and current with the proper assignment of meanings can be represented as uh, some amount of charge per time. And uh, the way we usually represent current here, it includes a sense of direction. So if you imagine applying time reversal operation, then the uh, current that, that used to flow from left to right might be now flowing from right to left. So, um, so the sign of current I will change. So, um, so here you will see that um, when you look through here, you will see that this current um, changes into minus i, and um, and here in this example, under time reversal symmetry operation, you should see v change into minus v, and you might look at this and say, oh, so when we apply time reversal of symmetry operation, we have actually changed the law. Biot-Savart's law, it, because this is the only term that depends on time. The everything else are just the functions of position alone, nothing moving. So um, under time reversal operation, magnetic field will have changed the direction. 
and um, I hope you're not <laughs> tricked by me, <laughs> seeming to say that time reversal operation is in a symmetry of nature, because we saw exactly that before with the charge conjugation. Electric field changed the direction, but that didn't necessarily mean that loss of physics um, uh, was not um, invariant under charge conjugation. Because again, what you have to look at is, well, how would you detect those changes? And the most common thing we look at is the force. How does the force change? That's the question you want to answer. And as you look at the force, um, the first portion of this force, nothing happens to it under time reversal. Charge, time reversal doesn't change the amount or sign of charge, electric field. Because charge is not affected, electric field is not affected in any way. Now in the second term, we do have this, the velocity changes direction, but one other thing also changes direction. That's, what, that's why we went through Bill's Albert's law. Magnetic field also changes direction. So when you take the product of these two things, then it turns out, hey, all these minus signs, they cancel out. So under time reversal operation, electromagnetic field, uh, electromagnetic force remains the same as it was before. And so, um, so this would tell us that electromagnetic force obeys a time reversal symmetry. The loss of uh, the electromagnetic <laughs> loss of nature does not change under time reversal operation. And I have another example from mechanics here with the momentum conservation. So if you look at the left-hand side or the right-hand side, the directional momentum will change because it's proportional to velocity, but the, the fact of equality itself won't change because uh, both the left and the right hand side will flip the direction. So this leads us to a discussion of a parity, which um, is, it's, uh, it's something that people um, kind of took for granted for a long time. So, you know, we're asking the question, are laws of physics invariant under the operation? And I do want to, kind of delineate subtle differences here so that you're not confused in the future. Um, when we describe the parity operation, what we are really looking at is taking X, Y, and Z and reversing all those coordinates so that it's now minus X, minus Y, and minus Z. And uh, this is a nice kind of handling it in a mathematical algebraic way. But in terms of visualizing it, it's just terrible <laughs> way to visualize things. Um, so if you hear about parity in a more uh, kind of conceptual approach or maybe in a more um, physics books written more for uh, popular audiences, you might hear of something called um, mirror symmetry or uh, mirror inversion, mirror operation. Um, let me just call it mirror symmetry. And when you are looking for mirror symmetry, uh, what it looks like is actually this. So let me draw uh, kind of what looks like a mirror for me. And let me just draw a right-handed coordinate in front of this mirror. So um, I have for my right-handed coordinate, uh, let me say I have my x-axis pointing kind of left-ish, and I have my y-axis coming towards me, then x cross, I'm sorry, I'm trying, I'm doing it from my perspective, x cross uh, y, <laughs> so, or to, for your perspective, x, uh, x is originally pointing to left and then cross uh, y, uh, x is pointing to you, uh, the cross product goes up, so t goes up, this is the, um, this would be the, my right-handed coordinate. Mm -hmm. And when you imagine looking at this uh, object through the mirror and look at, imagine um, observing what's, uh, what you see in the mirror, that's where you see the uh, kind of the mirror version of this. And the mirror version of it, when you look at it, it should look something like this. Uh, so X will remain the same. Uh, that's what you will see, right? If this is the model that you're holding. And G will actually remain the same as well. It'll just point up. And what will actually change the direction is the Y axis. Before it used to point towards you. Um, if you are, you know, 
farther away from the mirror than this so model object. Within the mirror, you will see the y-axis pointing away from you. So, so the mirror symmetry um, is one where only one of the axes is inverted. So instead of choosing to invert all three axes, you just choose one. That's the one that uh, associated with the plane of the mirror, and you invert that. And when we talk about parity or mirror symmetry, we tend to talk about these two interchangeably for a really simple reason. Um, it, when and if you want to get this, you can get it by it in this way. You can do it through one mirror operation plus rotation. So I did one mirror operation to get this left-handed axis. You know, if there you had to do X cross Y or X, X cross Y uh, with the left hand to get Z. Uh, that's my left-handed axis. And if I want you to, so what you do get under parity operation is, you know, neither of these two things. It's uh, under parity operation, what I should get is X should be inverted, Y should be inverted, and G should be inverted. And this is also left-handed axis. And in fact, you can get this from that by 180 degree rotation around the Y axis. Just imagine turning this around 180 degrees. So, so because um, um, the kind of the coordinate system you get with a, a single mirror operation can be associated with the one from the full parity inversal. You can get it by just the rotation operation. And we believe rotation is a symmetry of nature. We, uh, we tend to use these two things um, interchangeably. When, because when you are looking at these two pictures, it's not quite clear that they are related to each other. It's a kind of easier to see these two and see that they are related. So when we are visualizing it, think, things, we tend to visualize them using mirror symmetry. And when we are doing algebra, we tend to use a parity operation because uh, just to inverting all three axes is more algebraically nicer than choosing one and then inverting that. So <laughs> with that long intro to parity, uh, we can quickly check that um, all these laws of physics are invariant under parity operation. So, um, so the, yeah, so let me just go through that. So when you look at the magnetic field, um, you see something that I do want to caution you not to expect it all the time. So, uh, so just observing how magnetic field behaves under parity, let me just go through each one of these um, one at a time. Uh, this is a constant which won't change. Current, um, it can be positive or negative depending on the direction of time or the sign of charge, neither of which have anything to do with these coordinate variables. So current will remain the same. R will remain the same. Now we have these vector quantities, uh, spatial vectors. So under parity, DL will become minus DL. And this R hat vector will become minus R hat and there's cross product. Uh, the nice thing here is that these two minus signs will cancel each other. So, uh, so under parity operation, direction of magnetic field, it doesn't change at all. So it's like, it's all good. Uh, it's uh, nothing to worry about here. And um, I included the Coulomb's law to make you start worry. <laughs> because <laughs> when you look at Coulomb's law, you don't see the same thing you see with the uh, Bio Savart's law. So K, Q, R, they all remain the same. Because um, you know R squared when you know R reverse R, it doesn't change the magnitude. But you have this as just a unit vector. That becomes minus R hat. So under parity, magnetic field didn't change. It, the sign of the magnetic field under parity doesn't change. But the sign of electric field under parity, it changes. So one could easily wonder and worry. <laughs> we have Lorentz force, electromagnetic force, which is combination of these two things. Then uh, are we, do we finally have an operation that, um, that, that is not obeyed by nature? And as I was saying, parity has been assumed to be uh, respected for a very long time, from the time of classical mechanics all through uh, 1950s, really. 
And there's a reason for that. It's because electromagnetic force actually does obey parity. If you go through this carefully. So we are looking for um, how the force might change. And okay, it does change. Q doesn't change, but E changes into minus E. Now, in this second term, even though the magnetic field won't change the sign under parity, velocity will, because velocity is a vector. The spatial components of velocity will change its sign. So this will become minus V. So, so force, it does reverse the direction under parity operation. And I guess uh, I'm having to backtrack a little bit from saying, oh, if a force doesn't change, then, um, then the laws of nature is invariant under this matter. I have to actually generalize a little bit more. So you could have a situation where force indeed does change the direction, but, um, but you know, the law, what we refer to as laws of physics was not the law that electro, electromagnetic force always points to right or points to right. That, that wasn't the law. The law is um, maybe the work that the electromagnetic force does. Or So when you are looking at the quantities with the direction, those quantities will behave in certain ways under parity. And, um, and the, the, when you have those vectors that, are, that exist in your description of nature, um, that alone doesn't uh, make you say that parity is not uh, obeyed. And um, you, you, need, you need them to occur in a particular combination. And just to wrap up this introduction, you've actually seen two types of vector quantities here. Um, the magnetic field in Biot-Savart's law, that is a vector. Uh, force in electromagnetic force, that is also a vector. But as you've seen in this discussion, their response under parity operation is very different. And so we have a wor word that it's used to categorize all the vectors, all the quantities with a sense of direction into these two categories. The um, force is, this is, I guess, what you would call just the vector or what you, we are used to calling vector. Um, or if uh, I want you to be more specific, I could call this polar vector. And uh, really the new term that's invented is uh, for quantities like a magnetic field. And there are actually many more examples of this that you've already seen. Um, angular momentum is one of these actually. And <laughs> what, what it's called is it's called a pseudo vector. And it's a pseudo meaning um, it doesn't quite behave like a vector. It's like a false vector. It behaves like a vector in the sense that under rotation, it does the same things that vectors do. But it's a pseudo vector because under parity, it doesn't do the same thing that the, um, the vectors do. Usually the pseudo vectors are constructed as a cross product of two vectors. That's how they're usually constructed. Uh, that's why a lot of rotational quantities like spin is a pseudo vector. So, so as we are considering whether um, parity is a, a symmetry of nature, one thing that we have to pay attention to is, are the vector quantities in our description of last nature, pseudo vector or um, polar vector? Oh, and the other name for pseudo vector is axial vector. I guess axial, it's uh, meant to evoke an image of things uh, swirling around, which is uh, one of the ways to describe like magnetic fields or spin. Um, so that's a kind of discussion of parity and things related to it. And um, so I guess uh, me saying that the, the fact that the sign of a vector changes, that shouldn't be your reason to say that, oh, parity is not a, a symmetry of nature. Then <laughs> I hope you're asking the question, then what is a, a sign when parity is violated? I hope I got the slide or the right. Um, yeah. So what you do look for, that it can be give, that can give you a clear indication of whether, um, whether something is a, uh, whether you have a potential parity known conservation or not, is what we call rotational invariant, or it's kind of a fancy name for scalar. It's a dot product. Um, so 
when you have dot product of vector quantities, um, they are kind of by construction, they are designed not to change under rotation. So um, these quantities, they, they don't have a sense of direction. So when these reverse a sign, that is an indication that uh, something in the laws of nature um, has changed. So work is just one such example, force dot uh, distance, or you can also have that product of a vector with itself, momentum times that product with itself divided by 2n that gives you kinetic energy. And this uh, last example is uh, one such example of a rotational invariant, which shows a potential non um, respecting of parity operation. Because this quantity that is being defined as a helicity, it's uh, constructed as a dot product of a pseudo vector and a vector. It, uh, um, this is a spin, um, angular momentum. So this is a pseudo vector. When you apply a parity operation to something contains, that contains a spin, the direction of spin won't change, uh, not under parity under mirror symmetry in my, but not under parity. <laughs> so, so this is a pseudo vector and this is the unit vector for momentum. So this is a vector. So if you imagine uh, having some kind of uh, quantity of helicity and, um, or you have a system in which you could uh, give, um, um, uh, kind of describe the helicity of a particle in the system, a particle that has some spin angular momentum is moving in a particular direction, then you can take the dot product and give the helicity. Um, for this particular combination of quantity, when and if you apply parity operation to it, uh, this will reverse a sign. So an example of law of nature that would uh, violate um, parity symmetry is, for example, uh, energy of something depends on helicity. Then uh, under parity, helicity will reverse a sign. And if that leads to change of energy levels, that is a concrete example that this uh, shows that this particular system does not obey um, the parity symmetry. And if you can find that this particular system that consists of elementary particles, then you have elementary laws of nature that doesn't obey symmetry, or that doesn't obey parity symmetry. So that's uh, what you do look for and um, in looking for parity violation. And um, all of this uh, might sound horribly um, unmotivated <laughs> as in, okay, so this is all fine and fun mathematical things to talk about, but why do we care about parity symmetry? Like, why should we expect the, the mirror world to behave the same way the our world does? And th that leads us to a puzzle called theta tau problem. I think if you read it through Feynman lectures so in physics, I think uh, he actually mentions this is as the theta tau problem. It's a very old problem. So, you know, the, around the time of Feynman lectures, I think they were just to uh, have, they just resolved it. And to uh, tell it briefly, the, but to describe this problem here is that um, this, this is in the, in the time of the particle Jew and uh, particle physicists were finding a whole a fauna of particles that just uh, multiplied over and over. They were ident identifying new particle every day. And they had a particle that they had initially identified as theta. And they had another particle that they identified as tau. And they identified it as two different particles because um, they had a different decay modes. One of them decayed into two pions and the other one decayed into three pions. And while, while a single particle could uh, decay into different uh, methods, uh, that's what we sometimes call branching, uh, uh, branching ratio and uh, your branch ratio describes the what percentage goes into what, into what, into what. Um, the reason these different decay modes force the particle physicists to, to call this by two different names, identify them as two different particles, is because of the per total parity number of these uh, decay modes. 
pion is um, so did you when you look this up in the particle data groups uh, the handbook uh, you look up this symbol that has a j pc j is the spin angular momentum pion is a scalar spinless particle has spin zero and the pc gives you the uh, parity and the charge conjugation number um, and pion has a parity number of minus, meaning it's, uh, I guess, it's anti-symmetric. Um, so if a parity is an obeyed symmetry in this interaction, then whatever parity number you have on the right-hand side should also be the same parity number on the left-hand side. So these two decay modes have different parity number. This says plus one, this says plus one, and then minus one, so minus one. So, um, so a, a single particle can have two different parity numbers, right? So that's why they had to identify these two as two different particles. And that distinct identification was becoming problematic because the more they found about, about uh, theta and tau particles, they <laughs> had all the same, uh, same properties. They had the same spin, they had the same charge, they had the same mass. And maybe in some initial measurements, they were different, but the more precisely they measure, the more they agree. And so, so this, this is what got particle physicists thinking. What if a parity is not conserved in these interactions? Just a what if? Because up until this point, particle physicists had no reason to doubt the parity as a, uh, a uh, good symmetry of nature, a symmetry operation that's um, obeyed, observed by different interactions in nature. So this actually leads to something um, that's uh, more relevant to, to what used to be my research, uh, <laughs> it, which is a connection between parity and the electric dipole moment. But I think I can skip that for now because uh, I'm looking at the time and I want to wrap up this story. And it is not necessary to bring in electric dipole moment, although we could. And um, and I will just uh, skip to the end with the electric dipole moment. I'll say that although there are good reasons that fundamental particles should have non-zero electric dipole moment, and when they do measure it, it'll be a great uh, measurement. Someone will get Nobel Prize for it. But no one has uh, so far measured the non-zero electric dipole moment for any of the elementary particles. Um, the, the most research efforts are either with the electron or neutron. And there are very good upper limits for those. And these upper limits on electric dipole moments have been a great killer of theories, <laughs> um, just ruling out theories that didn't pan out. But um, people are still working on this, trying to one day measure non-zero electric dipole moment that uh, tied to our rest of our discussion today. So skipping that. Um, one thing I do, I one thing I do want to highlight is the work of the people who started the, all this um, thing about the electro uh, search for electro electric dipole moment, Purcell and Ramsey, and I wanted to just highlight this quote. Um, who, uh, after reviewing the existing evidences, existing experimental evidences, they said um, the so they so. Um, in reviewing the experimental evidence, um, well, well, let me just say the quote. Uh, so the question of the possible existence of an electric dipole moment of a nucleus or of an elementary particle in view of the above. And what he refers to the view of the above is, um, you know, I actually don't remember. <laughs> this is a rather short article. Um, I don't recall if the above was the argument about uh, electromagnetic or strong interactions, or if it was um, other things that, um, but what's important here is this uh, attitude that's really part of the paradigm in modern physics, that this particular question is a purely experimental matter. And this is an attitude that you will see time and time again with uh, a lot of experimental physicists and actually uh, even theoretical physicists. Um, you know, does a neutrino have a mass? 
well, that's an experimental matter. Um, in fact, you know, we were assuming that neutrino didn't have a mass before the discovery of uh, discovery of neutrino oscillation. Neutrino oscillation shows that at least two of the three neutrino flavors should have mass. Then you could also ask the question, should the lightest neutrino have mass? And it's an experimental matter <laughs> until you measure it, you don't know. So in the fundamental physics research, a lot of what people do in kind of test of standard model is establishing an upper limit. So when personnel Ramji went out to um, kind of infer from existing data, they said whatever the electrodipole moment of neutron should be, it cannot be greater than this. If it were, we would have seen it. So they designed the experiment to, to actually measure it, and they improved this by two orders of magnitude. And it's been improved by many orders since then. People are still working on it. And, and, and with the electric dipole moment, it's a mixed story because there's a good reason, good theoretical reason that there should be non-zero electric dipole moment. That's why people are still pursuing it. But non-zero, a non-null result has not been measured yet. Where we do have a non-null result, we, we have an actual positive result, is the, um, is, is the, the experiments that are were proposed by theorists uh, Li and Yang, and the experiment that was conduct, uh, conducted by, oh, I forget her first name, um, I think it starts with the C. I don't remember. Well, uh, you, you can look up the article. Um, she conducted the experiment, I think, at Columbia. And, um, and so let me just go through this timeline. So around the same time, so uh, Personnel Ramji, he, they published this in 1950. Li and Yang were uh, particle physics theorists who did a more, did a careful search of the uh, literature on, okay, is do we have actual evidence of parity conservation? And they've seen plenty of evidence of parity conservation, but all those evidences had to relate to either electromagnetic force or strong force. So they concluded that we have no evidence that with a weak interaction, like a beta decay, that parity is conserved. It's an interesting observation. So uh, together with their colleague uh, at Columbia, they devised an experiment where um, if there's a parity non-conservation in weak interaction, that, uh, that they would be able to see it. They were hoping to see something like, okay, maybe parity is not conserved all the time. Maybe it's violated 1% of the time, 5% of the time. So they devised an experiment. They polarized the sample of cobalt-60 and the way it's polarized uh, by looking at the direction in which electrons are decaying, they could, or the, the beta rays are being emitted, they could, uh, um, they could detect some degree of a parity violation. And I think I'm just putting thoughts, <laughs> uh, imputing thoughts to them that they may not have had, you know, they might have thought uh, this is the first, uh, uh, first attempt. And if a parity violation is not uh, happening to a great extent, then they will have to revise the experiment to improve it, to make it more sensitive. Now, when, when they actually did the measurement, what they found is that there's a maximal parity violation, as in parity is violated to the maximum extent it can be. So maximum extent it can be in any weak interaction. So as far as weak interaction is concerned, parity is not observed at all. It's as if it's not a factor at all. And I think that's what uh, led the person and uh, Ramji to actually publish the any other upper limit that they uh, measured and um, kind of resume their pursuit of NEDM. And this is something else that I think I'm out of time to get to. So, so the measurement that um, that um, they did, at, I think it was done at Columbia, um, is this. Uh, beta decay of polarized cobalt-60. And there's nothing really special about cobalt-60. It's just uh, what was easy for them to polarize using external magnetic field. And it's uh, cooled to cryogenic temperatures, I think. And um, it's, uh, 
and there's a kind of efficiency limit to how much they can polarize it. And uh, I think it was polarized only like 1% or something. So, so that's where kind of sensitivity comes into factor. If a uh, uh, parity violation does occur, but it only occurs 1% of the time, then you have a polarization efficiency on top of that. If there's a, uh, if a, uh, um, so, so they are looking for the asymmetry between the direction of beta rays being emitted. And with the counting statistics, there's a limit to their sensitivity. So they were kind of hoping that parity violation, however much it is, that it would be large enough that it would be within their detection sensitivity. And the big surprise was that it it was just way above it uh, because the parity violation is basically 100 percent any um so all the asymmetries that they saw could be so if they had been able to polarize the, these uh, cobalt 60 nuclei in all in one direction 100 percent then they would have seen beta rays go out 100 percent in only one direction like uh, these are all coming from so they wouldn't exist and and um it's a um, kind of a, a fav it's, a fav it's a moral story in modern physics that because a parody has been accepted as a, a symmetry of nature for a very long time, so people were just accepting it, and no one has or no one until Li Yang and Wood thought to look for uh, evidences of parity violation. Or if they did, they didn't do it thoroughly enough. They looked for it in electromagnetic or strong interaction, didn't find it, and then gave up. Turn, the first time someone, anyone ever looked at evidence of parity violation in weak, weak interaction, they found it because it's a, such a large magnitude signal. And uh, this is the kind of thing that, um, Physicists who work on fundamental research dream about, um, and you know, when you find it, you get Nobel Prize, like these three physicists did. And um, you know, the, that kind of discovery doesn't come along that often. And um, there's uh, also, oh, and this is the helicity. So one of the the um, uh, clear evidence of parity violation that you will see in standard model is that neutrinos come with a definite helicity. So what this is describing is the helicity of this antineutrino. This uh, antineutrino has a positive helicity or it's right-handed. If you make your thumb go in the direction of the momentum, the spin angular momentum of the neutrino, antineutrino kind of goes in that direction. And if, um, so if a parity was, um, obey the symmetry in weak interaction, then you couldn't have all electro, all antineutrinos come up with only one helicity. That would be asymmetry. That something is uh, some kind of, it's, it's, it's an asymmetry. So in if it was parity or good symmetry of nature, you would expect to see both of this and the inverse version of that. Oops. Uh, uh. Yeah, inverse, so I don't have, you would expect to see this and the inverse version of that. Now, you don't see that. With the antineutrinos, you only see this with a positive helicity. Now, um, the CP is the combined operation of parity and charge conjugation. That was actually what people thought was, okay, so parity is a bad symmetry, but maybe we need, what we need to do is we need to combine it with another symmetry operation. Maybe CP is a good symmetry. And uh, neutrinos actually do demonstrate that because if you take this and just apply charge conjugation, you might want to see neutrinos that are coming out with a positive helicity and you don't ever see that. Uh, if you were, so this is kind of an unrealistic thing, um, you know, a treat anti tritium decaying into this. But when you look at similar version where neutrinos come out of that interaction, neutrinos always come out with a negative helicity or neutrinos are left-handed. And the fact that neutrinos are left-handed in the standard model is how, it, that's how the parity violation is built into the standard model. And, um, and, the, the connection between the neutrinos, which are left-handed, and antineutrinos, which are right-handed, 
uh, that they are related to each other through CP, bio, CP operation is um, evidence for at least approximate, um, approximate conservation of CP, the combined operation of charge conjugation and parity reversal. And uh, now the story goes on. There's, there's an actual CP violation. Um, so CP symmetry would have uh, described particle antiparticle symmetry. You know, you, uh, so to go from particle to antiparticle, you do charge conjugation. But if you do just do that, you won't get what's actually in nature. You also have to do the parity inversal to get something that actually, the antiparticle that actually exists in nature. Um, and the thing is here, we don't want symmetry. If we have a perfect symmetry between particle and antiparticle, um, it gets very limiting because uh, what we really want is, uh, yeah, so is a CPO good symmetry. Uh, let me just skip to the end here. What we really want is, um, we want asymmetry between particle and antiparticle because if we have that, then we can explain this uh, cosmic question. Why is there more matter than antimatter in the universe? Because the fact is we do. There's more matter than antimatter. And it would be an easy thing to say, that's how the universe started. Universe started out with a net imbalance of matter and antimatter. That's an easy answer, but it's an easy answer like a saying, uh, when you hear, when you see lightning and hear thunder, you say, you explain it by saying God of, uh, uh, the God juice is angry at us. <laughs> I mean, it's an explanation, but it's an easy explanation, but it's not a good scientific explanation. And there, there's a kind of bias uh, to us as scientists and cosmologists. So we don't want to think of earth or our universe as a special place a special one-time thing. Like if we had to say that, that kind of seems like a capitulation that we are just admitting, hey, this is idiosyncratic. We don't have an explanation. We want to have a more fundamental explanation. So cosmologists uh, like to set the initial condition of universe at um, net neutral universe, no asymmetry between matter and antimatter, at least at the starting place. And what to describe this a baryogenesis is the process that uh, that's been proposed by some guy named Andrei Sakharov. I think one of the rather well-known physicists in Russia. He's well known for his political things as well. I think um, so. One of the conditions that would be needed for this baryogenesis, starting from net zero matter antimatter. Um, imbalance is a process that violates, uh, has a CP violation in it. And, and we do, uh, we do have some CP violation in our standard model. It's just not um, enough. Right? Do I say that? Yeah, I guess I don't say that here. We do have CP violation in standard model. That's what to describe it here. Um, and um, this amount of just, it's there, so it's, uh, at least the, to the question, is there CP violation? The answer is yes, but um, there isn't enough of it. So one of the avenues for searches for physics beyond the standard model is for uh, looking for evidences of CP violation that is not predicted or included within the standard model. So, okay, so um, I, I think I'm way over time. Um, so that's a kind of, um, well, aspect of particle physics where a lot of work has been done way back in the 50s, 60s, and uh, there's a lot that we know. And at the same time, there's also a lot that we don't know because um, there, we, we have good reasons to think that there must be additional sources of CP violation and we are still looking for it. <laughs> and one of the ways people are looking for it is through uh, uh, the, the through searches for neutron electric dipole moment. And uh, and one thing I will say about research, and, uh, and this is actually why I like teaching a lot better than research is that research is never ending. Um, I mean, which is actually a good thing, you know, people are curious uh, when they do um, find enough when, they, when someone detects neutron in the end, then someone else will build up on their work. And, you know, science is an iterative thing. It's all good. <laughs> That's how things should be. 
but uh, there's an aspect of research that's just never ending. And um, <laughs> one thing I do love about teaching is that it does, at least this class, it ends at some point and um, <laughs> whatever regrets there are, at least from my perspective, uh, uh, there's a fresh start uh, for you and for me. Um, so, um, so I'll end it there. So, um, but for those of you who might go into research in the future, it, it's a, you know something to think about. There's always uh, next steps. What comes after? That's kind of things that if we are ever giving a talk on the research that you're doing, you should always build that into talk. Like this is the work we've done. And here's something that we would like to do more uh, in the future. You should always have that. Uh, 